Yes. This is the John Wall. I'm going to talk about um, new results in perfectly secure MPC and broadcast, console time and efficient. This is a John Wall with Itai Abraham, Shlovani Patil, and Opita Patrick. And what I'm going to talk about is actually two papers that are closely related and kind of um, complement each other. One is asymptotically free broadcast in constant expected time via PACT VSS, which was published in TCC last year. And I'm gonna talk about detect, pack and batch, perfectly secure MPC with linear communication and constant expected time, which was published in Eurocrypt uh, this year. And both works are with the same set of authors. So they're both with Itai, Shavani, and Alpita. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is MPC, I'm sure you're all familiar with, but before we even start, um, what is the setting? So I said perfectly secure MPC. So we talk about perfect security. Here we have computationally unbounded adversary, which means that we, we want zero probability of error and we care about optimal resilience. So the number of corrupted parties is no more than N over three. And we know that this is time. This is the, the best we can hope for. In that regime, we have uh, the feasibility result of uh, Ben or Goldwasser and Williamson that show that any function that we want to compute, we can compute with perfect security in this setting in the presence of N over three where malicious corruptions. Okay, so this is the feasibility result. It's actually, they have a construction and, and, and uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with, but uh, what I wanna care about is what is the actual cost of perfect MPC? And over the years, there were many works that improved uh, the communication complexity. And in this talk, I'm gonna focus on specific setting where the depth of the circuit to be computed is going to be constant, okay, or very small. We look at shallow circuits. And when you look at perfect MPC, we see two classes of protocols. One is efficient but slow, and another one is fast but inefficient. So what do I mean by that? So I'm presenting now the costs in the broadcast hybrid mode. So, I mean, this is a line of work. We have very famous works over the stock test of time work, CCC test of time work among those works. And the communication complexity in the efficient but slow, we get um, C times N. So C is the size of the circuit to be uh, computed. So it's uh, times N, N is the number of parties. So this is like beautiful. This is linear in the size of the circuit. The broadcast on the other end is N log N. We have to broadcast many messages and there are also um, sequential broadcasts, which leads to round complexity, which is order N. So it like uh, depends on the number of parties. And why it's so slow, it's because those protocols rely on what is so-called player elimination technique. And with each, um, with each step, when someone recognizes some corruption, we kind of remove that corrupted party or set of parties from the protocol and repeat some part of the protocol. So this is slow. Every time we're going to repeat and the, the number of parties that we are removing is small, is a constant in each time. So this is what, what it leads to order and run complexity. The other set of protocols um, gives order one round complexity, which is amazing in the broadcast hybrid model, but the communication complexity is really, really high. What we have is the C times N Q. So for every gate, every multiplication gate, I have to pay N Q, which really, uh, Clearly, it's really uh, inefficient. Okay, so this is what we have. We have this phenomenon. And now I want to ask, this is in the broadcast hybrid model. What happens when you come and want to implement the broadcast? What is the total cost of a point-to-point -point channel? So, you know, point-to-point, -point, all the parties are, are connected. We want to know the cost over the point-to-point -point channels and no broadcast. So we need every time that we call to broadcast to replace it with some protocol or a point-to-point -point channel. So um, 
what is broadcast? But let's just say what, what broadcast is. So this is essentially our primitive for uh, MPC. We have a sender that has some message and it wants to deliver the same message to all parties. And what we have here, the, the, the important properties is agreement. So all honest parties must, uh, must output the exact same message. You all have to agree on the message. And um, we also care about validity. What is validity? If the sender is honest, then the message that the sender was the input of, of the protocol, the message that was the input of the sender in the protocol, this is the output of all parties. Now, broadcast is difficult because if we have a corrupted message, it can send different messages to uh, each one of the parties. And then the parties like look at their messages need to agree. What did you get? What did you get? And so on. If they need to, to reach an agreement, what actually was sent. Maybe someone tells me that um, the message was some what the message was M1, but the dealer actually just sent it M. Okay. And, and we have to reach this agreement. Question so far? Okay. So you know that question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you talk about communication and on the uh, we also need to care about the computation complexity. Is that interesting? What do I care about? Um, so is there merit in considering the computation complexity of the parties as a parameter as well? It's not not really interesting. I mean, it's usually proportional to the communication complexity. Um, what it actually costs is the communication and not the computation. Because these protocols are, are efficient in terms of uh, computational complexity. But they are, of course, proportional to the amount of messages that I have to send. Um, so there is some factor that you need to, to multiply to move from communication complexity to computational complexity, but, but computers today uh, do it very fast. Okay, so this is broadcast. This is broadcast. And this is how we usually study broadcast. But what we notice that if you look at protocols, there is a different communication pattern that actually um, occurs. And this co the specific communication pattern, uh, we can optimize it better. So let me explain. So the way BGW works is that at the very beginning of the protocol, each party takes its input and its secret share it among all parties. Now, because we have militia, we are in the malicious setting, the um, the the um, the secret sharing is a verifiable secret sharing. The parties have to check that they actually received consistent shares. So we have in parallel and VSS. Now each VSS, if we look down at BGW, we have n point to point messages that are going along, and you know parties complain about the dealer. The dealer reveals some some shares and so on over the broadcast channel. So we have also n squared messages that have been, been delivered over the broadcast channel. Now, what we actually have is n parallel instances of VSS. So the total communication complexity of doing it all in parallel is n cube point to point plus n cube broadcasts. Now, the best we can opt for, for broadcast, if I need to broadcast n cube messages, the best I can opt for is to have something like n to the four. And why is that? Is because if each one of us needs to receive a message of size n cube, it means that because we have n parties, the total communication complexity is n to the four. Okay, is that clear? Good. So this is the, the, the communication pattern that we see. This is what I'm going to denote as n parallel broadcast of messages of size n squared, okay? So we have n instances in parallel and each party broadcasts a message of size n squared. It means the total, each party is supposed to receive n cube. The total communication, the best that we can opt for is n to the four. Okay, so let's see how to implement broadcast. And you look at the literature and you find again, 
two classes of, fun, of uh, protocols. One is efficient but slow, and another one is fast but inefficient. So let me explain. So um, first, first line of work over here achieves n to the four communication complexity, which is the ideal. You cannot do better. But the run complexity is again uh, linear in the number of parties. Okay, so each part, each time that we have to broadcast a message, we need to wait a lot, a lot, a lot of rounds until everyone agree on that message. We don't send much messages in each one of the rounds, but we have many, many rounds. The second um, class of protocols is fast but inefficient. What do I mean by that? So the round complexity is expected constant number of rounds, but the communication complexity jumps to n to the six. Okay, so again, we don't have a protocol that is both efficient and fast. Now I want to mention that strictly order one rounds is impossible to achieve. There is a lower bound. So really the best we can hope for in terms of round complexity is expected constant number of rounds. Okay, now if you care about what I, what I described here is n parallel broadcasts of n squared, the actual cost, if you look at just one party broadcast a message of size L, here it's n L plus n squared, and here it's n squared L plus n to the six. Okay, so those, those are the complexities. Um, okay, so what does it mean for us? This is actually horrible because if you have a circuit that has depth 10, really constant time, constant number of, uh, constant depth circuit, but many parties, 300 part parties. So you expect, you know, you run in the broadcast hybrid model, you have like 10 rounds of broadcasts. Instead, when you compile it and use this efficient but slow um, broadcast implementation, you get something like 3000 rounds, which is completely inefficient and you cannot really run it in practice. The other, the other uh, protocol, so I want to, to explain something. So when we look at the communication complexity, um, when we say that it's n to the six, it's actually, it's the total communication complexity. Now, in, in, in reality, parties, we have n parties. So it means that each party sends or receives something like n to the five and not n to the six, okay? So when you look at n to the five, and you have, let's say, 300 participants, exactly like we have in the blue. So the best we can hope for is that each party sends or receives something like n cube. And n cube for 300, something like 27 megabytes. What we get instead is that each party sends or receives n to the 5, and n to the 5 is 2.4 terabytes. OK? So it's really, really terrible. Um, now, what does it mean? when we take those broadcasts and apply it to the MPC protocols that we just, uh, when, we, well, when I started the talk. So when you look back at the MPC, we said we have two classes of function, two classes of protocols. One is, one is efficient but slow, and another one is fast but inefficient. So if you take a fast and efficient but slow MPC with efficient but slow broadcast, what are you gonna get? is a very slow MPC. And if you take efficient but slow MPC with fast but inefficient broadcast, you get something that is slow and inefficient. And if you take something that is fast but inefficient, like fast and inefficient, you get something which is really, really gonna be terrible in terms of communication complexity. So just like to put the numbers down there, so over here we get CN plus NQ, which is amazing. But the run complexity becomes n squared. Now I want to say run complexity is really um, much worse than communication complexity because rounds takes a message takes a lot of time to be transmitted. While communication complexity, we have channels today of like uh, one gigabit per second or ten gigabit per second. So when I look at um, something like that, um, this is really really high. The other class of protocols, again, this was the linear uh, size protocols, linear communication complexity, we get there n to the seven, and the n to the seven becomes the dominant factor. 
And when we apply here to the fast protein efficient with fast protein efficient, we get that on each gate, you have to pay something like n to the six. You actually get constant number, expected constant number. Okay, so really everything is pretty bad. And this leads us to our goals in this research. So um, we have actually two goals. One is I want a better broadcast that is efficient and fast. And I want an MPC that is efficient and fast. And then a combination will be efficient and fast. Okay, questions? Uh, yeah. Um, so is there any lower bounds known in this case that maybe there's a trade-off between uh, being fast and being efficient? I don't, I'm not familiar, familiar with any low amount. So um, I guess it's really also how to prove such a low amount. Okay, thanks. Uh, so that's the answer. Okay, so these are our two goals. And I want to explain now, I want just to review the result in the first paper. So broadcast is efficient and fast. So our main result in DCC was a parallel broadcast. Again, we look at this end dealers broadcast in parallel some, mess uh, some different messages. So parallel broadcast protocol with perfect security and optimal resilience. So we look at uh, N times broadcast L for N senders, each broadcasting a message of size L. The best we can opt for is what we say N squared L because we have in total N L size that I'm supposed to receive and we have N parties, so it's N squared L. And the best we can opt for is n squared l plus expected constant number of rounds. Uh, and this is what we achieve. So we achieve n squared l plus n to the four. What is an expected constant number of rounds? What is mean for us? So the protocol is balanced. Each party sends receive roughly the same way, same size messages. And what it means that when I do n times broadcast n squared, it's essentially free. Okay? I don't pay for the broadcast except for the expected constant number of rounds. So when I compile from Borders hybrid model to the plane model, I just get constant number of rounds again and not strict constant number of rounds. Okay? And if you're interested for one party broadcasting the size of message L, we get NL plus N to the form communication and constant number of rounds, expected constant number of rounds. Okay, so this is the main result of TCC. Just to understand what's going on. So if we had a total complexity of n to the six, which was the best before, now we get n to the four, 300 participants, as I mentioned, n to the five, it means that each party sends or receive n to the five, n to the five is 2.4 terabytes, which will take you over a channel of one gigabit per second, it will take you uh, several hours. But if you have n cube, you're gonna, um, send or receive something like 27 megabytes, and this is gonna take you 200 milliseconds. All right, so this is really significant. Okay, and now when you apply that to the MPC, the situation becomes much better. Um, here we don't touch, I mean, here you take the, 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 the broadcast that is efficient but slow, but now using our broadcast, uh, we reduce this n to the seven to, to the n to the five, and here n to the six becomes n to the four, Still, we are not really comparable um, in terms of communication complexity with this one. Okay, so um, what is the best? I don't know. Okay, now I wanna move to the Eurocrypt paper. So I'm not gonna really describe anything about the TCC. Um, the Eurocrypt, what we show is a perfectly secure, optimally resilient MPC protocol with C times N plus N to the four communication complexity. And this N to the four comes from the broadcast, yeah? Uh, and constant expect the number of rounds for constant depth settings, okay? So what does it mean here is that we have a new MPC protocol that if you use also our broadcast to implement uh, the MPC, you get overall this communication complexity. And here we are almost as good as this communication complexity is just this n to the four, n to the four versus n to the three, but the, the, the round complexity is like, you know, very significant. Okay, questions? 
Okay, so what I'm going to talk until the rest of the talk is about the EuroCrypt, uh, the MPC result. And I'm actually not really going to describe the entire MPC protocol. We have no time. Um, I'm going to focus on one main technical result, which is an improvement of verifiable secret sharing. Okay, so along the way, in order to get this result, we get something, uh, we improve verifiable secret sharing. So let me explain uh, how we do that. So, very, or, or what is the result in terms of uh, verifiable secret sharing, the, 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 in, the, building, the main building block that we improve. So um, before our work, to share one secret, you have to work, we say the n square point to point plus n square broadcast, which becomes n to the four on point to point. And this is just for sharing one secret. Our TCC protocol, actually the way we achieve, um, we improve the broadcast along the way, we came up with a malicious secure, maliciously secure VSS that enables you to pack N secrets at the same costs, at the same cost as, as, as uh, distributing one secret, okay? So this is an order N improvement over that of BGW. Now, um, with our U, in our Euro group paper, we thought that this is like amazing, you know, improve the, I personally didn't think that you can improve any further. And that in the Eurocrypt, we actually came up with a protocol that is n cubes. So you can actually share n cube secrets at the same cost as one secret, okay, as n to the four. And um, I want to just mention that this is order n improvement over BGW, and this is order n square improvement over our TCC. One more thing is that before our work, this is after I compiled the broadcast. Before our work, to share one secret, you have to pay n to the six because of, of the broadcast, okay? So it's actually, uh, what we see here is n to the six, we reduce it to uh, n to the four for n secrets, which is an overhead of n cube per secret. And here we have an overhead of n per secret. Moreover, we have a relaxation of secret sharing, a verifiable secret sharing, which we called it detectable secret sharing. It doesn't guarantee all, all what we want from a verifiable secret sharing, it's a relaxation. But here we achieve something which is truly, truly nice. We have n to the four secrets at the same cost as n to the four point to point. What does it mean? That the overhead per secret is just all the one. Okay. Questions? Don't have any questions, but just this seems very, very impressive. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Gerard, can you say uh, at least one or two sentences on what this relaxation is and what are what can we're gonna, you... we're gonna see. We're gonna... I just say one more. So one important thing in uh, secret sharing is, is, you know what? I'll say it after this time, but remind me that I have to say it after this, okay? Okay, so uh -huh. if I look at the techniques or how we achieve this goal, we're gonna have three things, three design principles. First, we're gonna pack. What does it mean to pack? So you know how you do in Shamir secret sharing when you distribute one more than one secret, just by packing, uh, you know, putting more secrets on the polynomial on minus one polynomial when you evaluate it on zero minus one minus two, you kind of put a lot of secrets. So we're going to use pack. And if you are familiar with verifiable secret sharing, then we distribute um, a, a bivariate polynomial, which is of size n squared. So okay. what we have here is again, uh, we're going to pack up to n squared secrets in one by the bivariate polynomial. So this is pack. Another design principle is batch. What do I mean by batch? We're gonna run many instances of VSS in parallel. And the important thing is that we're going to design the secret sharing in a way 
that even though we're going to run M different instances, we use the, the broadcast channel uh, the same as we use it as one instance, OK? So even though we have many instances that we run, the same dealer runs in different uh, instances, we kind of aggregate all the broadcasts that were supposed to be in the protocol in the M instances, and we kind of shrink them as we have just one instance that is being running. So whenever we do this dispute, dispute control and trying to understand, not dispute control, but the verification, we try to understand if we really send the right message or did not send the consistent messages, consistent shells and so on, we just use the same amount of broadcast as um, on the entire M, M instances. And the last thing is detect. So what do I mean by that? So this is like player elimination. In a sense. So um, during the protocol, I'm gonna identify some corrupted parties. And uh, when I identify corrupted parties, I just remove them from the protocols and I don't talk to them anymore. But as opposed to uh, player elimination, which was really, really slow, like every time we removed only constant number of parties, here we're gonna have fast detection. Whenever we detect parties, we're gonna detect linear amount of parties, like T over four or T over two, something like that, and remove them from the protocols and restart. So the number of detections that we're gonna have, the number of times that we have to repeat or, or uh, redo the protocol is gonna be constant. Now for Pratik's uh, question, um, what is the relaxation over here? The relaxation over here is that um, in the detectable secret chain is that, um, you know, the, the, the entire goal of VSS is that we share, we have a sharing phase and we have a reconstruction phase. And after the sharing phase, we have to be sure that there is a well-defined secret. Okay, and um, and we also have to be sure that the reconstruction will always succeed. What we have in detectable secret sharing is that uh, reconstruction sometimes might fail, which really sometimes defeats the purpose of uh, secret sharing. But if it fails, we're gonna have this mass detection that we're gonna detect a lot of parties. So you cannot use it to all applications whenever you need VSS you cannot always replace it with a detectable secret sharing. Um, but for our purposes of MPC, there is a one place when it actually suffices and this is uh, where we use it. Okay, I think it's fine. Yeah, so just a follow up, so in detectable secret sharing, um, when the reconstruction phase, you can detect this. Uh, can you also detect which party Behaving maliciously, so can you could you like do some player elimination afterwards? I mean, it's a detection with respect to the dealer. It's like I'm not gonna talk to you, but I'm not sure there's gonna be like, like me and Pratix are, are not friends anymore. But it doesn't really mean that you, we still the other parties don't know if it's me the bad guy or Pratik the bad guy. But in my instances of secret sharing, we are not gonna talk anymore, and uh, this is fine. This so is, the dealer uh, can detect. So the dealer can detect which party is here. It's essentially the dealer detects. Yeah. Okay. It decides oh. which parties it doesn't want to talk. To. Okay. Like makes mess in the protocol, and of course it's never gonna detect honest parties, because honest parties are honest. They're not, never gonna be detected. But a malicious dealer can maybe detect some honest parties and say that it doesn't want to talk to some honest parties and will not know which is the good good guy and who is the bad guy. Okay, so uh, as I said, these are the three design principles, pack, patch, and uh, detect. We call the paper detect, patch, and pack and batch. Just one word how the MPC looks like, like just, you know, in, in general, because what I'm gonna talk about is only, you know, this on the very bottom. But the way the MPC works is that um, there is an offline phase and an online phase. In the offline phase, we generate before uh, triplets with no dealer. 
To do that, we have N parties. Each one is gonna generate triplets with a dealer, so dealer, it's like triplets are, look something like that. So this is in signature and everything. This is signature, this is signature, this is signature. And um, when a dealer, when we have a dealer, the dealer knows the hidden values with no dealer, no one knows the hidden values. And this is what you need to later uh, compute uh, secure computation with uh, viver multiplications. And uh, so this is the structure of protocol. So we generate a lot of viver triplets with no dealer. Uh, by each party is a dealer, they're gonna generate many triplets. And the way we generate triplets is essentially we do VSS. And then I prove to you using zero knowledge that, um, that I, I failed, you know, that, um, sorry, that I actually gave you um, a triplet, a multiplication triplet. Now the detectable secret sharing is gonna be used in this zero knowledge proof that I'm gonna to prove to you that I actually gave you um, a, a good, good, uh, good, good triplets. Now, if it fails, we just, you know, don't use those triplets that uh, the guy uh, generated, but in, in total, we're gonna fail only constant number of times. So it doesn't matter. I mean, if we fail doing, we do this reconstruction, it doesn't work. We just no, don't consume this invocation of a triplets with a dealer and we'll use, would you just run it again and make more triplets again? So it's gonna be only constant number of times when the detectable signature is gonna fail. Okay, good. Okay, so this is just a um, general idea how the protocol looks like. Now I wanna talk about actual verifiable secret sharing. I hope I have enough time. So let me ask you, are you familiar with BGW VSS? Not really. Okay. Not really. So let me try to explain how. So, um, so the input of the dealer, so this is the warm up. Um, the input of the dealer, instead of univariate secret sharing, univariate polynomial as we have in Shamir, here we want to, you know, it's verifiable secret sharing. After I got my, my share, I need to check that this piece of something that looks like garbage actually makes sense and define a real secret. So to do that, the parties needs to somehow communicate and see if what they got and what you got somehow makes sense to get. So the dealer is gonna distribute, instead of choosing univariate polynomial, he's gonna choose a T by T bivariate uh, polynomial, not secret chain, but bivariate polynomial SXY, okay? That, by that, I mean the X is of degree of most T and the Y is of degree of most T. Now the dealer is gonna to send to each party a row and a column on that polynomial. So the shares of each party is FIX, which is SXI, and GIY, which is SIY, okay? Now, what is nice about um, a bivariate polynomial is that I and J have, some, have two points in common. If I evaluate my a share on J, I'm gonna get SJI. And if uh, PJ is gonna evaluate his point on I, is again gonna get SJ, S, SJI, okay? So we, you think about it as a grid, so we have two points that are in common. So each party PI sends to each other party PJ, the subshells uh, UIJ, VIJ, which is FIJ, GIJ, the two points on my polynomial that you also have. And each party after it receives those points is gonna check that what I got from the dealer and what I got from PI actually um, consistent. And what happens if they, do, they are not consistent? They don't make sense. It's not what I expected to receive. I'm gonna broadcast the complaint. So how the complaints looks like, and we're gonna to tell to the entire world that something, is, is fi something here is fishy. So I am going to complain, I'm PI, I'm complaining that I received something wrong from PJ, 
But what I put in the complaint is the values that I received from the dealer and not from PJ. From PJ. Okay, and this is kind of important. Okay, so after, so we have a, each party receives shares, the, the parties exchanges sub shares, and then each one checks the shares is correct. And if not, they're gonna broadcast uh, complaints. And um, now the dealer has to decide or, or to like, each complaint is not clear if it's PI and PJ disagree or maybe the dealer is corrupt. So the dealer kind of needs now um, to reply and say why what it said is actually correct. So by doing so, how, how does it what what does it do, what it does is that for each complaint that is being sent, it's gonna look at the two values. And if the two values, remember that those two values is what the dealer gave me. So if I see that uh, as a dealer that someone is lying over here in this message, I sent him one thing and he's telling the entire world something else, then I'm, I know that this party is for sure uh, malicious. So I'm gonna broadcast his entire uh, row and column, his entire share, okay? So this is how the dealer resolved the complaints. And then the parties need to see if the dealer successfully resolved all complaints. So what I mean by that, so um, each party has to decide now if he's happy or not with whatever he saw. What does it mean by happy? So if I see two John complaints, I and J, I complain about J and J complain about I, then the dealer must reveal either the share of PI or the share of PJ. Cannot be that I complain against you, you complain against me, and the dealer say they are both right, okay? Because we see inconsistency, the dealer has to get involved in. Now, I'm happy if any complaint was, a joint complaint was resolved, the dealer did not reveal my share, and whenever he revealed something, it revealed some shares, those shares agree with my share. So if that, all of those conditions happen, I'm gonna broadcast good, I'm gonna say, I want to accept this share. Um, and the output is that if 2t plus one part is broadcasted good, then we are happy and we can output the shares FIX and GI. Questions before I continue, I'm now gonna analyze it quickly, but um, about the structure of the protocol, Okay, so let's see why why does it work. So what happens if we have an honest dealer? So if you have an honest dealer, what's gonna happen? So the dealer is gonna send shells. Each party is gonna send sub shells. And what about this check between honest parties? I, I'm asking whether two honest parties are gonna complain on each other. No, no honest dealer. It's an honest dealer. We're not never gonna complain. Whatever I receive from the dealer is consistent. We're gonna exchange our shares and we're never gonna complain on one another. Okay, so all the complaints we're gonna see are either from honest parties to corrupted parties or from corrupted parties uh, to honest parties. Now, uh, if there is a false complaint, the dealer has to reveal the share of that uh, false complaint. Will the dealer ever going to uh, broadcast or reveal a share, publicly reveal a share of an, uh, of an honest party. Mm. No, because whenever I complain, I complain with the values that the dealer gave me and they are fine, they're always fine, okay? So what we get is that all honest parties are actually good. We have two T plus one honest parties and all honest parties actually have shares as we wanted. So I wanna say more, one more thing is that the adversary learns nothing during the verification. And why is that? Whenever I complain about, uh, I'm an honest party and complain about the uh, corrupt parties, if you send me something wrong, I have to complain. Um, the shares that I'm going to reveal, you already knew them. I'm gonna reveal the shares that the dealer gave me, you already knew them, the adversary knew them. 
Now, if something goes publicly, also the dealer, we are gonna only reveal shares of corrupted parties. So the adversary already had those shares you know, to begin with. So we never reveal something uh, that the adversary didn't know already at this point. Okay, now, uh, the as I said, the dealer never reveals the shares of the honest parties, and all honest parties were gonna break us good, and everyone's gonna be happy. Uh -huh. What's gonna happen with the party, co corrupted dealer? Yeah, sorry. So the, the output step, like, are you outputting the two polynomials that? Yeah, so I mean, yeah. This is just the verification phase. Later, ah. we might have the construction where we come and reconstruct the polynomial or reconstruct just S00, where the secret is. I didn't explain that. But I'm going to embed the secret at S00, exactly like you do in Shamir. Okay. So the reconstruction phase, you kind of need to reconstruct um, the bivariate polynomial or just like a line on the polynomial and, and uh, learn S00. Okay, one more thing about output that I didn't mention in this in this uh, succinct uh, description is that if I'm on an honest party and the dealer uh, revealed my share, then after the share is revealed, uh, I'm not gonna broadcast good, but if actually two d plus one honest party two d two d plus one uh, party is broadcasted good. I'm going to take my share as this value that the dealer uh, said publicly. Okay? There's something that I didn't mention. Okay, what happens in corrupted dealer? So if we have 2D plus 1 honest uh, parties that broadcast good, then it means that we have at least T plus 1 honest parties that are happy. And the shares of those T plus 1 uh, honest parties uniquely define a bivariate polynomial. And I want to say that now all the other honest parties must hold shares that also lie on this bivariate polynomial. And just to, to see why is exactly what I mentioned now. So if I don't have a share, if, if my share was revealed, so it's public, everyone knows my share, and each party in this uh, T plus one honest parties, it checked that the revealed share uh, fits um fits whatever uh whatever I received. Okay, fits consistent with its own share. Moreover, um so this is what we claim that the shares of all honest parties must lie on that polygon. Okay, so this is the BGW uh, VSS protocol. What is the cost of this protocol? So here we have the complaints. So each party might complain against uh, order n uh, parties. So this is something like n parallel broadcast of order n broadcasts. And here the dealer might uh, reveal shares of parties. So we have one party that broadcasts a message of size n squared. Okay? So this is what we have. Um, Okay, so this is the cost. And of course we have this uh, n squared point to point that we had over here. So this is n, to n, n squared point to point plus order n squared broadcast in total. Um, when you compile the broadcast, you get n to the four just for one secret. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna pack a lot of secrets in one bivariate polynomial. So uh, BGW, they have T by T, and they embed the secret only over here on uh, S00. In the TCC paper, what we did is um, we packed, in a sense, bivariate polynomial where the F's polynomials are of degree 2T and the G polynomials are of degree T. And then we could pack uh, T plus one secret secrets on those uh, S to the minus two is zero S to the minus one zero and S to zero. We could pack more, more secrets. And to get the detectable secret sharing or to do actually uh, T squared, we have to increase in both dimensions. 
And when we increase to both dimensions, it makes the verification much, much harder. In a sense, we don't really get verifiable secret sharing. As I said, we get something just a relaxation. But we look at a matrix, which is the dealer is going to choose a polynomial, which is of degree t plus t over 4 times t plus t over 4. And we can embed many secrets over it. Again, embed something like n squared secrets over it. OK? So this is the path. Our secret sharing, let me try to explain uh, what we did. So the input of the dealer is uh, t plus t. Yeah, question, key. Is there any specific reason choosing t over 4? t like, um, not, not really. Um, I, I think you can push the parameters a little bit. I think we actually did t plus t over 4 times t plus t over 2. But there is um, something about error correction codes, I know you love them, uh, that actually comes into play over here. Um, we can talk about it later. It's a bit more. Sure. More. Uh... OK, so our protocol is going to be exactly the same as BGW in the beginning. OK, so each party is going to get a shell. Um, and then I'm going to send subshells, extend subshells. And each party check the subshells and going to complain against another dealer and other parties. But now it's coming uh, where I actually previously, what we had is that if the dealer is not happy, he's not going to reveal my share entirely. And this was very, very expensive because if we have two parties that I'm not happy with, I'm going to reveal each broadcast message is of size uh, t plus one because I'm uh, broadcasting a polynomial. So this was order n squared broadcast. Instead, what we're going to do is that if I see a false complaint, I'm not going to broadcast the polynomial of that guy. Instead, I'm just going to say that this guy is corrupt. OK, so I'm going to add i to some set conflict. And I'm going to broadcast that set. OK, now let's see the output. And this is not the entire protocol, um, just like the first, the first example. So if we have, so the, the dealer broadcasts whoever he doesn't like, whoever he doesn't want to talk to. If this number of parties is greater than t, then clearly the dealer is corrupted and we can discard the deal. Moreover, each party can see a joint complaint. And if we see a joint complaint, then it might be, must be that either I or J are supposed to be revealed, supposed to be in the bad set. Okay? So if I see a joint complaint in which neither I nor J are in conflict, I'm going to discard the dealer also. Now, um, we are like, uh, no, that all joint complaints were resolved. I mean, if we didn't discount the dealers so far. If we have set of conflicts that is too bad, too big, is greater than T over four. Now I want, I want just to explain. So each party that's in conflict, it's really nice that I broadcast that I don't want to talk to him. Still, I need to provide it uh, a new share or I need to, to convince anyone that the share that he's going to get are actually, uh, they're going to be a correct share. So um, if it's too big, the number of shares that I need to correct, I'm just going to restart the protocol while forcing those shares to be zeros. OK? So I'm going to re-choose a bivariate polynomial where all the parties in conflict, their shares are going to be zero. Okay, and otherwise, then we're gonna have a sub protocol. So if we didn't restart, if we didn't like, has this mass detection, this is what we call the detect. So if we didn't have the detect the, this uh, restart, we are actually happy and, and uh, can proceed with the protocol to the second stage. Okay, so let me just explain, uh, I introduce now, because we repeat the protocol, I want to say that we have a new set, which is called zeros. And whenever we have um, what, what the dealer chooses 
is a polynomial. So zeros is like all the conflicts that they had in all previous, um, all previous uh, iterations. So uh, what the, the, the dealer does is gonna ch choose all those values at zeros, all those univariate polynomials at zeros. And when the parties check that their shares are consistent, they don't talk to, to those parties in conflict or in zeros. They're just gonna assume that their shares are zero, okay? So I don't need to broadcast anyone the actual shares. I just like, you know, um, compressed it and everyone knows that it's just zero. Okay, so let me explain what we have uh, until now. So what do we have? If the honest, if the dealer is honest, so all the parties in conflict must be corrupt, okay? And in corrupt the dealer, I wanna say that all shares of honest parties that are not in conflict must be consistent. And why is that? Because if we were not consistent, we would have, you know, during the um, sub shares, I would see that our uh, two, two shells are not consistent and I would broadcast a complaint and then the dealer must reveal, I must either add me to the conflict or, or J to the conflict, okay? Because two honest parties that are inconsistent, they both gonna broadcast complaint, complain on each other and the dealer must add one of them, otherwise is discarded. So what we have at the end of this phase is that the shares of the honest part is actually defined unique by variant polynomial of the, the appropriate nuclear. And what is remained for the protocol, the second stage, is that all honest parties in conflict should also learn their actual share. Let's see what is the cost. So here we still have N parallel broadcast of order N because we have those complain anyone can complain on anyone else. But here, instead of the dealer broadcasting a message of size n squared, revealing a lot of polynomials, it just broadcast one, one set of size order n, okay? So this is, a re we reduced order n over here. Now, I wanna talk about patching. So what we wanna do is to run many instances of this uh, VSS or detectable secret sharing in parallel. And in parallel, what I mean is that, um, so what is the problem with parallel? The problem is that um, if we run M instances, I'm gonna complain, one part is gonna complain on each other many, many times, gonna complain M times. So the broadcast is gonna be dependent on M. I now want to have that all the broadcasts will be completely independent of M. So what we're gonna do, is that if I see a conflict with PJ in let's say X instances out of the M instances, I don't need to complain about J so many times, X times. It's enough to complain one time, let's say the first, the lexicogra lexicographically first instance for which we actually see uh, inconsistency. Now, if two honest parties complain on each other, um, then the lexico lexicographically first uh, instance is gonna be the same between the two complaints. And then we got the exactly same effect as we wanted. It's like, if I see inconsistency, um, I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting one complaint against everyone, against each party that I see something wrong. And I don't need to do um, M complaints in parallel, I just do one complaint per party and two parties that complains against each other, uh, the dealer will must have to reveal, must add either I or J uh, into the, uh, into the uh, com, uh, com, conflict, uh, conflict set. Okay, so this is the batch. Now, what is the cost? So we still have N square broadcast, but for M instances this time. So if we set M to be N squared, so we're gonna run in parallel N instances of this detectable signature, sharing, we're gonna get a total of N to the four over the point to point. And what we're gonna, the number of secrets we're going to uh, distribute 
is n to the four secrets. So in total, we have order one per secret. Now, um, what is left is actually, uh, we need to show how to reconstruct the F and G shells um, of the parties that are in conflict. Let me do it very, very fast. I know that uh, the time is up. So all the parties uh, in those conflict have shells. We need to reconstruct uh, their polynomials. They need to receive their polynomials. And the current stage that we have is that all of the parties that are not in conflict have correct shells. And it also includes the honest parties that are, have zeros because when we define the polynomial, all the honest parties checks that the parties in zeros are actually in zero. So the polynomial has zeros in those values. So we have many honest parties. In a sense, when we continue, we have that conflict is as most uh, t over four. So it means that we have at least two t plus one minus t over four honest parties. So all honest parties, biased those parties in conflict have correct shares. Um, and because those are polynomials of degree t plus t over four plus one, um, we need something like 2t plus t over 4 plus 1 correct points to eliminate t errors. Never mind. What we get when you do the calculation and read Solomon code and so on, if you have more than t over 2 errors, you are screwed. Um, we, cannot re re we cannot reconstruct. Okay? Putting that in mind, let's take a look at the reconstruction protocol. Let's reconstruct only f. You reconstruct G in a similar way. So each party that is not in conflict that actually has a share, it's gonna send to each party in conflict its share on F. So remember by sending in my share on G, I'm actually providing him its share on F. PI in conflict is gonna try to reconstruct the polynomial. Now, if it received, remember, if you receive more than uh, t over t correct, t over two correct points from the corrected parties, it's going to succeed in reconstruction. If it received um, less, it received more than t over two errors, it's not going to succeed in the reconstruction. So if the reconstruction is not unique, it tries to reconstruct, if the reconstruction is not unique, it's going to complain, uh, broadcast a complaint. And now we do exactly the same protocol, but over the broadcast channel. So we put everything over the broadcast channel, every party broadcasts uh, the value that it has. Uh, whoever published the wrong value, the dealer is gonna publish a bad set. And you know, if all over what we have, we have now bad conflict zeros. If everything is more than T, then we're gonna discard the dealer. If bad is more than T over two, we are screwed because um, we're not screwed, we, we cannot reconstruct, but we detect now t over two corrupted parts. Okay, so I see what everyone sent to everyone else and I can reconstruct see that if someone sent something wrong over the broadcast channel, I can essentially um, detect uh, which parties are corrupted. And if bad is less than d over two, we are good. We know that we can reconstruct. So, um, PJ can reconstruct, uh, the, the part in conflict can reconstruct this value. Okay, so the main idea is that honest parties never publish uh, wrong shells. If reconstruction is not successful, the dealer must detect more than T over two parties. And the next iteration, we must succeed. And corrupted the dealer, remember that it cannot, we have binding honest parties now, um, they, they uh, hold shells on the polynomial, we cannot now reconstruct a different one. Okay, so let me conclude the talk. So what we show, uh, first conclusion, said broadcast is essentially free in perfect MPC. We talked about this communication pattern that uh, repeats in MPC, and we saw that broadcast is, is free. Second conclusion, as we, as we mentioned, we can get VSS with an overhead of order N, or a detectable secret sharing, which doesn't guarantee validity for constant number of iterations with order one per secret, overhead per secret, and 
when we come to look at the MPC protocols, all in all, what we get is CN plus N to the four with constant expected number. So um, with that, I want to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? So what what will be the constants in these O factors for your work? Like how how big are the constants? Do you have estimates? Um, as a theoretician, I can say not horrible. As a practitioner, I'll say uh, pretty horrible. Uh, <laughs> so it's not like two to the, I don't know, 100. Um, Do you know if there's like any other concrete cost? Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's like any I don't know the concrete I don't know the concrete cost. We, we can sit and calculate, but I don't know. Um, Another question I have is that, um, did you try some like more than bivariate polynomials, so like trivariates or maybe other kinds of error correcting codes? Does that help? So uh, this is a great question. Uh, for years, I thought it doesn't help, and now we have something that uh, does help. Okay. Um, but I don't want to talk. Invite me again. I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In like six months, you know? Yep. Yeah.